ești ca dușnici și ești de Jagiellonia University, de la Fersort Research Project și Gorge Fuga Grand Provence, her mentor in, in our center is Professor Bojana Chan. Today she will tell us about giant value sources and stellar populations. Okay, uh, thank you uh, for introducing me. Uh, I want to add uh, a little more because uh, during my PhD and now uh, during my grant project here, uh, I investigate this specular group of objects and during this seminar I would like to uh, report my results which I obtained last uh, which I last uh, obtained here, working here. Uh, so uh, let's start. And I hope that it not will be much complicated for you. Um, in general, uh, radio sources have very characteristic radio morphology visible on the radio wavelengths. Uh, at the center, we usually have a radio core from which two oppositely directed jets are emitted and as they expand they interact with intergalactic medium creating the hot spots and extended radio lobes. Uh, such a radio structure is a result of processes which are going in the central galaxy which coincides with uh, radio core and uh, we call this uh, galaxy as a host galaxy of a radio source. Uh, usually it is an elliptical galaxy, uh, but it is not a normal galaxy. It is an active galaxy, what means that uh, the accretion processes are active in their center. So the mass accretion onto, onto supermassive black hole causes the multi-wavelength radiation and sometimes we can observe it also on the radio wavelengths. I say sometimes because uh, only small fraction of uh, active, galactic, active galaxies uh, create such a radio structures. It is about 10% and uh, we don't know what is the explanation of uh, radio jets generations, generation. Uh, giant radio sources are a very peculiar group of uh, radio sources because uh, they have very large sizes of radio structures. They are defined as uh, sources with projected linear sizes larger, larger than 0 0.7 megaparsecs uh, typically, uh, normal radio sources have sizes about three times smaller. Uh, <laughs> it is just a def definition, but uh, I think, yes, but I think that uh, the persons who uh, named these sources as a giants uh, assumed uh, some speed of radio jets, some characteristic speed, and the time scales of uh, radio source activity, and they obtained that these sizes shouldn't be larger than 0 0.7 megaparsecs. Speed of jet. <coughs> Expansion. Um, and here on this picture, uh, we have uh, radio contours of four largest known today uh, giant radio sources. We can see that the largest one have a size uh, 4.7 megaparsecs and all of them are overlaid on the optical image of comma cluster. Yes. So what they are, I mean, yeah, I mean, they are, I mean, do we know what is inside? Uh, How they are built, I mean, what is that? Um, for jet generation, uh, the black hole and accretion disk is responsible. Why there is this distinction with the speed of the... And I know that, that I mean, but that explains okay. everything. Is that they, there are these shockwaves propagating. Yeah. 
Yes. They're not propagating in the black hole, they're propagating in the mud. Yeah. Otherwise, we will not know what it means. And uh, or I shouldn't bother that there is this, this distinction by the. I mean, the shockwaves carry the information about the how the matter is. Uh, what kind of matter and how it uh, the jets. The jets. The speed of a shockwave does not exist actually. It's a fictitious number in the equation of state, which describes what happens with the density profile somewhere. So why that, all, that number comes out of? Does it tell anything about this? Measurement. It is just a measurement in the sense that if you wait longer, you take two images of, okay, not in, 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 in the case of those sources, but in the case of more compact sources, you can take two images and then you see that on the next image, mm -hmm. the, uh, the position of this uh, brightening mm -hmm. is more distant from the nucleus. And then so you know the, the yes. As the difference of yes. Mm -hmm. yes. between the positions so divided this, by time. This has nothing to do with the inside how do we see? No. But if it's our measurement, then it's our gauge, right? We apply some kind of a gauge to this thing. Okay, so these sources are overlaid on the optical image of the coma cluster, and you can see that their sizes are comparable with the sizes of cluster of galaxies. So they are very, very huge objects. Today uh, we know only 340 uh, giants. It is mostly because uh, there are some problems with their detection and identification. Uh, and uh, what about the problems with detection? Um, when we want to detect giant radio source, uh, usually we need uh, good sensitivity radio observations because they have uh, they have low surface brightness resulting from the large angular sizes on the sky. Uh, also at higher redshifts it is hard to detect the radio bridges connecting the radio core and uh, the radio lobes and here we have such uh, examples of such uh, sources and uh, you can see we haven't got any connections between the core and the radio lobe. So uh, we don't know if we observe one extended radio source or we observe three point like radio sources. Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, also, when we want to identify a radio source as a giant, we need to measure it uh, projected linear size. So we need to know its angular size on the sky and the distance to the host galaxy which produces such uh, radio structures. So uh, on the left side we have example of uh, radio source for which measuring the angular size is a little bit difficult because we don't know if this weak radio structure visible here and this radio structure belongs to this central radio source. Yes. So we uh, can make a mistake in measuring such a radio sources. Uh, Total intensity. In a, uh, no, it is on the uh, specific frequency. It is 1.4. Yes. I don't, I don't hear. Uh, yes, 1.4 gigahertz. Okay. Uh, 
as something which picks up a given range of the frequencies, otherwise it will become uh, okay, and here we have a little bit different situation. Here the radio lobes are good resolved, but we don't observe any radio emission in the radio core. So we don't know which galaxy, which is uh, located somewhere between radio lobes, is responsible for generation of uh, radio structures. And basing on such a kind map, we uh, can't tell which one it should be. Maybe, for example, observations on lower uh, radio frequencies may show that uh, in some point we observe the radio core. So, okay. Uh, when we look on the distribution of giants on the sky plane, we can see that uh, there are a lot of uh, regions with where the large number of giants is identified and uh, the large areas without any radio sources. Um, near the galactic plane we haven't got uh, giants because here the identification of host galaxies uh, may be difficult due to higher e galactic extinction in this re region. But uh, at higher latitudes we also have very large um, regions without any giants. Of course, it doesn't mean that uh, these regions are somehow special. Uh, it is mostly because in these regions we haven't got uh, good coverage of radio and optical surveys. So uh, this is why we don't have any sources here. And as I told uh, earlier, uh, we know 340 giants. But when we, for example, measure the uh, surface density of giants in the densest regi region, for example, in this region, and then extrapolate it on the whole sky plane, then we should, uh, then we obtain that we should expect at least four times more giants. Okay, as an explanation of giants' origin, four hypotheses are considered. Uh, they tell that uh, giants, could, giants could be very old radio sources, which evolved to such large sizes. Also, they can be located at less dense environment where the jet expansion is easier. Uh, and uh, uh, the host galaxies properties can be somehow special. For example, they can uh, have more energetic central engines. And finally, that the recurrent jet activity can be responsible for giant sizes of uh, radio structures. All of these hypotheses uh, makes that the growing of the radio source is easier, but none of them uh, fully explain giant's origin. Uh, because we know a lot of radio sources, old radio sources, which are not giants, or some... It means... Uh, yes, they can be located in, uh, for example, rich uh, clusters of galaxies and also they are observed at higher, at higher redshifts where the uh, density of the uh, universe was higher in earlier cosmological epochs. 
Also, uh, all studies which aims the properties of host galaxies shows that uh, their hosts are very similar to the hosts uh, located in smaller sized radio sources. And finally, also the um, only 15% of objects where we observe the recurrent jet activity are giants. So, as you can see, um, we haven't got a clear explanation why uh, giants exist. So, in my research, I uh, trying to find another explanation, and I test. Uh, a different hypothesis, which tells that uh, the giants, uh, the, that uh, giant sizes of radio sources are connected with uh, the uh, history of host galaxy formation. So, we do not see them. But why these galaxies should care about the orientation of our galaxy? That's no, they don't care. Yes, they do, because you have shown no, I, I told that we haven't got uh, radio and optical data to I identify giants in these empty regions. So this is why we but don't but have... Still, but still, on the map that uses our galaxy as a background, you have shown that the distribution of these galaxies concentrates in the, the so to speak, upper regions. Yeah, because yeah. you have to be all the galactic <coughs> way, right? Because you are set in a kind of a nice. So you can have, have nice line of sight when you look perpendicularly to the galactic plane, yes. but you see nothing so in the So this is only plane. because of the, of the extension. The extension. Yes. Okay. It is only the extension, which is not only important in the equatorial plane, but also is important when well, you look it is at 45 degrees. Say. Well, so in other words, if we take care about the fact that we do an experiment in a very peculiar way, yes. is this distribution uniform? It should, it should be. be. Uh, okay, so uh, in my project, I would like to test the hypothesis uh, about the host galaxy uh, formation history, maybe responsible for giant sizes. And uh, uh, the history of galaxy formation depends on its internal evolution and also uh, depends on its evolution in a cluster environment. Uh, less dense environment, it means that if. Less dense also means that uh, we haven't, for example, we have one isolated uh, galaxy and no galaxies around uh, this, uh, this one, for example. This uh, is also the measure of um, environment density. So in filaments you have a lot of... Uh, No, it is uh, one of the possibility why uh, giants.
places where there's less matter. But and if these are fluctuations, then they have nothing to do with the density. Yes, density. No, the density. the density of the air in this room is uniform, yes. but it's fluctuating like crazy. That doesn't mean that there's that the density close to you is less. It's but higher it's than what? the density but the around me. Is Okay, so <laughs> okay, so when I want to investigate the internal evolution of galaxies and its internal and uh, the evolution of these galaxies in the uh, environmental in in their in or in uh, their environment, uh, in my analysis, I don't. I uh, focus not only on my central uh, galaxy, which is the host galaxy of radio source, but also by the same way, also by the same way, I study galaxies which are located at the same uh, group of galaxies, at the same cluster of galaxies. So, uh, in my to my analysis, I selected 41 giant radio sources, uh, for which I, for which the spectroscopic data uh, were available, and around them I uh, selected uh, neighboring galaxies, uh, which are marked uh, as uh, red. Uh, pluses within a radius of three megaparsecs around the host of the giant ga radio galaxy, and also all these galaxies have avail available uh, optical spectra. So why I need uh, the optical spectra? Uh, when we want to know something about the internal evolution of galaxy, it is good to know what kind of stars create our galaxy, what is the mass of our galaxy, what is the black hole mass of this galaxy. So all of these things we can obtain from the optical part of galaxy spectrum, which is mostly dominated by stellar component. And uh, we can uh, perform uh, so-called uh, the um, stellar population analysis, uh, which gives us an information about what kind of stars with a given age, given metallicity, given mass, creates our galaxy. And this can be done using uh, starlight synthesis code, which fits the stellar continuum in galaxy spectrum based on the superposition of uh, template stellar spectra. Uh, in my analysis, I used the base of 150 stellar spectra with uh, 25 different values of ages and six metallicities. And here we have an example of such a fit. Here we have a spectrum of a galaxy and here, by the green color, I plotted the uh, modeled stellar continuum. And uh, as I said, uh, apart from the stellar population composition, we can obtain the stellar mass and velocity dispersion of stars in galaxy. Because uh, stars have uh, um, spectra of stars are, have absorption lines. Uh, the emission lines comes from the AGN, 
active galactic nuclei inside the, uh, the galaxy. Yes. Yes, and the velocity dispersion is uh, uh, calculated based on the broadening of these absorption lines. And uh, the velocity dispersion is used to the black hole mass determination. Uh, so, as I said uh, before, I selected 41 giants. Uh, and I found 390 neighboring galaxies around them. Uh, as a comparison sample, I used a large sample of uh, smaller sized radio sources, uh, which are here named as uh, FR2 radio sources because they uh, were selected from the ca catalog of FR2 type radio sources, and uh, their uh, large number of neighboring galaxies. Uh, for each of these galaxies, I provided the stellar population composition. So, for each of these galaxies, I have a, had a information about its stellar composition, stellar mass, and black hole mass. Um, so, then I averaged my results uh, for each class of objects separately. And here we can see the uh, resulting. Um, stellar population composition. These histograms uh, simplifying, showing, the, um, showing how many stars with a given age create our galaxy. So on the uh, horizontal axis we have the age of the stars and on the vertical axis we have a percentage contribution of stars uh, to the galaxy light. And uh, on the left side, I comparing the uh, mean uh, giant uh, mean host galaxy of giant radio source with mean neighboring galaxy, and on the right side uh, the same for uh, the comparison sample. And here we can see that uh, all of these galaxies are dominated by old stars with ages larger than uh, one giga year. But as you can see, the hosts of uh, radio sources uh, plotted by uh, red uh, have larger amount of the oldest stellar populations with ages about uh, uh, 10 giga years. It is uh, not surprising because, uh, as I said on the beginning, uh, usually, hosts of radio sources are elliptical galaxies, so they are, are old stellar systems, so they should have a large amount of uh, old stars. But uh, neighboring galaxies are uh, of various types, so here we can have, for example, spirals, ellipticals, irregulars, so um, this is why we... we uh, we see such a difference. The more interesting is a comparison between hosts of giants and hosts of smaller sized radio sources and uh, between their neighbors. And uh, the most important thing which you can see here uh, is that uh, Smaller sized radio sources uh, plotted by violet have larger amount of the oldest stellar populations, but uh, giant radio sources have larger amount of intermediate age. Yes. Uh, this is because uh, in a <laughs> Because in uh, modeling, uh, which I used, uh, the starlight synthesis code uh, assumes that the oldest stars are older than uh, the... Uh, no? no. They have, but... Uh, from 
Yes? No. No, it is not because of the scale. Maybe you are sure, but uh, everything is all right. <laughs> Okay, so as I said, uh, for smaller sized radio sources, we have larger amount of the oldest stellar populations. And for giant radio sources, we have significantly larger amount of intermediate age stellar populations. The same is uh, visible for neighboring galaxies, but here these differences are not as evident as for hosts of radio sources. And it can be better uh, visible on this table below. Here I uh, give the percentage contribution of each uh, population of stars, young and intermediate age and old stars, uh, for uh, each class of objects. And you can see that the largest differences are in intermediate and old stellar populations. And it is about 13% um, difference and uh, for neighboring galaxies we have about 7%. So, so again, so the But how you can uh, uh, measure this error? Because when you feed... Uh, no, because I feed every galaxy separately. So I choose the best fit of each galaxy, uh, which I obtained, and then I summarized uh, my results of all galaxies. <laughs> it is very hard to uh, to estimate the error in, uh, here. Okay. Um, at the next step, I uh, um, wanted to check the uh, distribution of parameters which characterize the whole group, uh, whole group around the giant and around the uh, smaller size radio source. And here we have, for example, the distribution of uh, summarized mass deponated in all galaxies in our group. On the red, uh, we have uh, giants, and uh, here we have uh, smaller sized radio sources. And as you can see, uh, these distributions have very similar uh, um, shapes, and they peaked near the same value. So we haven't got any difference in mass uh, of whole stars in a in a group and uh, the only difference is be in uh, ages so the ages of uh, giants are shifted to the lower values uh, also i compared uh, many other parameters uh, which i obtained from the stellar population analysis like uh, metallicities black hole masses and I didn't find any differences between uh, uh, giants and smaller sized uh, radio sources or between the groups with giants and groups with uh, <coughs> smaller uh, radio sources. 
so summarizing, uh, comparing all uh, obtained parameters which I obtained from the stellar population analysis, I obtained that the only difference between giants and smaller sized radio sources uh, is in their stellar population composition. So uh, giants have a larger fraction of intermediate age stars and also their neighbors uh, have uh, a larger amount of these stars. And uh, this indicates that uh, in the past some processes had happened which triggered star formation in the whole group. So, uh, and these processes were more efficient in groups with giants than in groups with smaller sized radio sources. Uh, the fact that the star formation occurred in the whole group indicates that uh, the environmental processes uh, may be responsible for it. So, now is the question, what kind of processes can lead to the global star formation? Uh, one of the possibilities uh, are the cold streams of galactic, uh, intergalactic gas, which penetrate the galaxies in the cluster. And uh, as they go throughout the galaxies, uh, they can disturb its uh, interstellar gas and uh, makes that the clouds of gas collapse and new stars uh, are created. And the second question is how these processes can be connected with the generation of large-scale radio structures. Uh, when we think about cold streams, um, it is, uh, they, co they can trigger star formation, by, but also they can supply the accretion disk and maybe in such a case, the accretion, the activity time of such a, uh, such a galaxy is longer. So also uh, the time of jet generation also is longer. So this is m why we maybe see the, uh, the giant uh, radio sources. Uh, of course, some other possibilities should be considered. But uh, now I'm just learning about all processes which are going in the uh, in the cluster of galaxies, which may be responsible for uh, such processes uh, which we observe. So, but I hope that in near future uh, I will be able to to interpret. Uh, fully interpret our results which, which I obtained. So thank you very much. Uh, so what is the main physical process responsible for the radio wave emission in, these, uh, in the jets and in these lobes? Uh, it is a synchrotron radiation. I see. Uh, I have actually a serious question. Thank you very much. It's an interesting talk and definitely it's a very interesting uh, phenomenon and unsolved problem why we would have such a population of giant radio sources and what would be the physical process behind them. Uh, well, cold stream, this question marks definitely should be bigger because I'm not f convinced that cold streams could be a uh, uh, a solution if you really consider carefully the dynamical time scales, right? The time scales, mm -hmm. well, you need to remove the angular momentum from the cold gas and to eject it close to the black hole is different than the time scales for the star formation and trespassing through the, uh, through the system. But can you actually uh, study, uh, well, can you have any kind of a follow up uh, uh, data acquisition programs for this for this kind of a galaxy groups because I think it would be very interesting to see what is the dynamical age of this of these objects I mean as a group as a total mm -hmm. because this would be something uh, very 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 interesting because in, if they are dynam dynamically old it means that definitely they didn't uh, undergo any um, uh, 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 traumatic e events in the in the recent uh, recent past which means it would be hard to explain why all of them they have star formation at the same time right but if they're dynamically young they, for example, could be disrupted by the larger tidal fields or mergers, 
that would be some, some indication. So do you have any plans to, to uh, acquire data or, or do some kind of a follow-up analysis for these objects? Uh, it is hard to uh, obtain new data, but uh, for example, dynamical ages, uh, you can obtain from which kind of observations? Well, you would have to measure, for example, the, the velocity dispersion of the whole group mm -hmm. and see if it's, if it's, uh, if it's uh, 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 virilized or not, for example. Mm -hmm. Oh, uh, maybe yes. Uh, there are some uh, catalogs of uh, cluster of galaxies where all of these uh, parameters are um, measured, but I don't know if uh, I don't know if for <laughs> uh, clusters mining, with guess, yes. giants. Are there any weak lensing observation of the systems, so we could have another map mass estimate? Uh, we have the masses of each galaxies, but. And we have from what oh, do you have the masses? What was the from the stellar population analysis? We have the mass of the stars, which creates the galaxy, and we have the mass of black hole. Right. So you don't have a mass of the total mass of the halo as well, in which yes. the galaxy resides. So Maybe from some uh, X-ray observations, we can have a mass of halo. But only for the central galaxies. I don't know if it is possible for these uh, surrounding galaxies because they are, they are uh, firstly, they are not active, and I don't know if they have such a. Um, uh Mm -hmm. They're more like associations, right, or groups, I would think. Uh, so maybe they, they actually they look very young, than likely, uh, as, a, as a system. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to ask, because you mentioned the X-ray observation, and uh, it just came to my mind uh, that uh, some years ago, some 10 years ago, I heard about something like the cooling flows in the clusters mm -hmm. of galaxies, which are observed by the uh, X-ray uh, mm -hmm. emission. Is it somehow connected with the cold streams you mentioned now? I don't Is know. <laughs> <laughs> now I don't know. <laughs> so, so, so how it is? Uh, because okay. these uh, cooling flows, mm -hmm. uh, their origin are in the central Aegean, yes? Cooling flows in the clusters. Then they should yeah. try to suffer. But this is initially this, this X-ray mm -hmm. gas, while cold streams are really intergalactic. So they come from outside the or galaxy cluster or even, or yes. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, first one uh, is how uh, uh, continuous and in what distance scales are these cold streams? Uh, can you uh, uh, repeat so, your question? Uh, I would like to know uh, at what uh, distance scales uh, can these cold streams be? Like how continuous can they be? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, because uh, uh, maybe because if they are really on a very large scale, it could also be possible to uh, look into these missing radio sources by connecting the dots of available radio sources. Uh, just uh, as I said before, I just learning about all of these processes, so I am not specialist in this topic. <laughs> Thank you.